everybody. We got a great one today, you know, for a change, because Dahlia Lithwick joins me again, and we have one of those uh, dire conversations, uh, this one about uh, what we're all beginning to fear, which is that none of the Trump trials will happen before the election, or that the only one that does happen is the Manhattan DA's uh, kind of small ball Stormy Daniels cover-up case. Although I will say that if Trump or Michael Cohn really hadn't hadn't paid her, Stormy probably would have squealed and uh, Trump lost the election. So maybe maybe it's not so small. Now, when you contemplate the damage that Trump will do to this country, to the world as president, you only have to look at what has happened since he nailed down the nomination in New Hampshire. He doesn't want the border bill, which James Langford from Oklahoma has been shepherding for the last four months. James is an interesting guy, deeply religious. Before he went into politics, he ran the Falls Creek Youth Camp, the largest Christian camp in the nation for years. He is a devout Christian and a rock-ribbed conservative. I, I, I don't know the details of the bipartisan uh, border bill yet that he negotiated, but I'm sure it's not a border bill I would write, but I'd vote for it. But now Trump is doing everything he can to kill it because Trump wants the border as an issue that he can use this year in his campaign. Now, the border bill is tied to uh, a supplemental for aid to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. And House Republicans are saying they won't take that up without the border bill, which they are happy to kill because their fearless leader Trump wants them to. I've warned of the damage Trump would do if he became president. He's already doing it now, right now. We, we have to fund Ukraine. In the Atlantic Monthly double issue that I talk about a lot on the show, on what happens if Trump becomes president, if he wins again, Ann Applebaum writes that Trump will pull out of NATO. Our NATO allies are funding Ukraine. They have taken hundreds of thousands of, of Ukrainian refugees. Biden put this alliance together the alliance of the nations assisting Ukraine. Putin is is Hitler. This is the first cross-border invasion since World War II. If the West doesn't stop Putin here, he, he won't stop. It took zero time since Trump sewed up the nomination for him to do so much damage. We've been warned about what Trump will do as president. This is the damage he's doing a week after he won the first primary. Dahlia Lithwick and I discuss whether the January 6th trial will happen before the election uh, because the Georgia trial isn't even scheduled until late August, and that one's run into a a self-inflicted wound or mess. And Judge Aileen Cannon is taking her sweet time on the documents case. So we've got a bit of a, a, a dark one today with Dahlia as as usual these days with with her, but also a great one, you know, for a change with the amazing Dahlia Lithwick. Dahlia, you just sent me a couple articles, one that you wrote in Slate and uh, another that was from what? Politico. Politico. They are basically about when we, when we were in communication about this, <laughs> uh, you we're suggesting that one of the four trials has to be the solution to this election. And then both these articles are saying it's not going to happen in time or may not happen in time. Right. I I think there is an immense amount of hoping and praying that either one of the criminal indictments or the Colorado Supreme Court case that's going to be heard on February 8th. Well, let's go to that one. Okay. That doesn't seem very promising. I don't know. I mean, on the law, he led an insurrection. Uh, So on the law, you would say, yeah, he can't be on the ballot. He 
that's what the 14th Amendment is about or largely about. That's exactly right. So so everybody knows the 14th Amendment because of equal protection and, you know, because of the various rights that come with the Reconstruction Amendment. But there's this Section 3, right, the Disqualification Clause that nobody's ever heard of until Donald Trump insurrected. And then suddenly all the historians, like principally Eric Foner and people who've been thinking about the Reconstruction Amendments forever are like, wait, (laughs) there's a thing that actually disqualifies from holding office somebody who led an insurrection or gave aid and comfort. And this was a Civil War, uh, post-Civil War Amendment, because, of course, all (laughs) of the insurrectionists wanted to run for office after the war. And were disqualified, and that's how we had Reconstruction. Right. I mean, the idea was you can't, like, take up arms on the battlefield or, you know, pledge uh, an oath for the Confederacy and then, like, run for office after you've lost. That was the idea. And... As you say, you can't sit by while an insurrection is going on and sit there for three hours and not use your presidential authority to say, go home, everybody. Right. Or say, come to the Capitol. It will be wild. Right. I mean, it it was I don't think there's a huge amount of dispute that this looks insurrecty. It was an insurrection. Yes. And whether you say Oh, he told him to go to the Capitol and he said it would be wild, but that doesn't mean he wanted people to wild there necessarily, but they did. And once they, it was clear and he was watching it on TV, we know that he's president of the United States and he obviously had the ability to say, hey, I love you, go home (laughs) three hours earlier than he did. And uh, he sat there for three hours enjoying it. Right. And saying that maybe Pence should be hung. Right. And imperiled his vice president and imperiled members of the House, right, and members of the Senate. All that happened. Yeah. The only question I think that the Supreme Court is going to answer, and this is right, the, we have this comes out of Colorado, where first a lower court and then the Colorado Supreme Court said, done and dusted. This was an insurrection. You participated in it. You were an officer under the plain meaning of what Section 3 says. We're taking you off the ballot. That's going to be heard. And and by the way, Maine has found the same thing. And Maine is waiting to hear whether they can take him off the ballot. And there will be other states that do the same. So your question is the right question, which is plainly, if you look at text and history, the way the originalists want us to do, both the text and the history suggest that Donald Trump is a good candidate to be removed from the ballot. If you're an originalist. If you're an originalist, if you do the thing that Sam Alito does every single day, you know, right before he does his push-ups, right after he flosses his teeth, originalism, then this is an easy case. And that's where you started. The problem is, and, and this is, I think, the piece you and I are talking about, that's a tactic, right? That is the Supreme Court saying, we are going to decide a case that will essentially disenfranchise Trump voters in at least one state, probably two, maybe more. And I don't think the Supreme Court is prepared to do that. Should they do it by the plain text? I think we're agreed. And and there's a couple of really good amicus briefs in this case by historians who are like, this is exactly what the drafters contemplated. Jamel Bowie has a good piece in The Times this week making the same point. It's not a question. It's not a close call. The close call is this political question of does the Supreme Court popularity ratings in the toilet want to insert itself into the 2024 election in the spring, which is when this will come down, of 2024 and knock a bunch of people off the ballot. So I think the question you're asking and the thing I'm trying to answer is, what do you do when this is clearly the right vehicle as a matter of text and history and intention and the good people of Colorado have made a decision and the good people of Maine have made a decision and the Supreme Court is going to be too chicken to do it? When you say the good people, you mean the officials who are in the right position? Right and got there by elections, et cetera. Right. And the state Supreme Court uh, in Colorado, which is a a pretty lefty court. And I think there's kind of two buckets of arguments. One is, 
oh, my God, we don't want to make Trump voters mad. They'll go crazy as though Mm -hmm. that didn't already happen on January. Right. We don't want them to insurrect. (laughs) That would be unprecedented. Right. They've already done it. So that's a sort of pragmatic, I guess, argument, which is this is not the way to do it. We are not going to suppress the vote because Donald Trump, his whole thing is that you're suppressing the vote. So that's a sort of a a normative argument about what we should do. And then there's just a whole bunch of, I think, decent technical arguments that Donald Trump's team can probably win pretty easily about. Did he have due process? You know, in the lower court, it was a couple of days trial. Did they really prove it was an insurrection? So everything would have to fall against Donald Trump for him to lose this. Everything has fallen into place the wrong way. And and, and here's the paradox that I'm sitting in, and it's why both of those pieces are the ones we're talking about. I'm willing to bet that there are five and maybe even six Supreme Court justices who do not want Donald Trump to be president in 2024, who believe that sitting on the last ashes of the dumpster fire (laughs) of democracy and free and fair elections would not be cool. Is this the vehicle they will choose to do it? Will there be four, five, six votes? But not only this, but what this really does is Colorado is going to go for Biden anyway. And Maine probably is going to go for Biden. But there's one seat. Maine is one of two states that lets you pick up congressional districts that go the other way from the whole state. And the other one is Nebraska. And Nebraska has a congressional seat that is a liberal seat. It's like the suburb of Kansas City. And so they've given, I think in the last election, Biden got one electoral vote from Nebraska and Trump got one from Maine. Maine's taken him off the ballot. So then he 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 would lose another one probably. If that happens. The one vote. Right. So the Colorado doesn't make any difference. So this, if if both of these survive and no other states add, it's one vote, well, one electoral vote. Except that we've already heard red states say, if this survives, we're knocking Biden off the ballot because he also committed an insurrection or Hunter did, or I don't know, (laughs) you know, Fonnie Willis did. But like they will find some pretext to say we will use, like you said, the, the elected machinery of this red state to knock Biden off the ballot. And so there is this very real pragmatic fear that in this kind of mutually assured escalation of crazy that is going to disenfranchise voters this is a pretty dangerous thing to do. And so very smart people, like I'm thinking of Lawrence Lessig, like very smart thinkers who do not want Donald Trump the, to win the election are arguing very strenuously Keep that they the do not to, want to do it this way. Keep them on the ballot mm-hmm. and don't give them an issue. Yeah. Okay. Now, what I want to ask you about is immunity. Because I yesterday I was going like, we're, we're going to discuss immunity, right? And you said, uh, not that important. Why is that? Here's the problem with the immunity case. And this is a larger problem with the law generally, which is. Let's say what the immunity case is. Yeah. So there's a couple of lawsuits, right? There's a couple of big honking lawsuits, criminal lawsuits filed against Donald Trump. One is the sprawling conspiracy racketeering case that Fonnie Willis filed in Georgia. Mm -hmm. That one's going to be, it's going to take months, years. We don't know. Now, Fonnie Willis is tangled up in in drama, but we always knew that was going to be, it's kind of the maximalist big swing case about January 6th and trying to set aside. And then there's the smaller one. And the smaller one is is the one that Jack Smith files in DC in in Judge Tanya Chutkin's court. Right. And he essentially strips it down for parts, right? It is not a complicated case. He's the only defendant as of right now. There's unindicted co-conspirators, but he is the only defendant. Right. And there's no bells and whistles. It's just like, dude fomented an insurrection and tried to set aside the election result. And the reason to have the maximalist and the minimalist was the minimalist, the 
one in Judge Chutkin's court was going to go fast. That and that was, was going to be first, basically. That was going to be March. First. That was supposed to be heard in March. And then, and then the immunity thing was filed, and it was heard in the D.C. Circuit, and it seemed like a pretty simple no. Right. But there are three judges, and two are Biden appointees, and one is a Trump appointee. And the suspicion is, in the questioning, did the Trump appointee ask questions that made you go, hmm, she is uh, trouble? All three, uh, the oral argument. So one thing to say, let's explain what the immunity suit is. Maybe yeah. we'll start there. Yeah. The immunity suit is Donald Trump makes the claim he can't be on the hook for anything that Jack Smith is holding him responsible for because he has what's called absolute blanket immunity. When well, you're president, when you're you president. can do anything. Now, did a judge ask, could you hire a yes. SEAL team? Navy to, SEALs, to, yes. A Navy SEAL team to assassinate a political mm -hmm. rival. How did the Trump lawyer answer that? He kept whinging about it, Al. He kept being like, you know, kind of sort of maybe, but da 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 da. Like he kept evading that hypothetical. And you're quite right, George. As judge. opposed to going like, no, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, you can't, he, you can't do that. He he kept fudging it, but the the answer essentially was yes, blanket immunity. Me and you're exactly right. Judge Florence Pan asked that hypo Navy SEAL to take take someone out. I mean, the, the hypotheticals were extraordinary. And just to answer your first question, even Judge Henderson, who is the the um, conservative judge on that panel, was pretty skeptical of this theory that when the president does it, it can be anything. He can yeah. murder people and assassinate people. He can refuse to step down and, you know, he can he can uh, uh, decline to be impeached. Right. It's an absolute theory of power. It was heard so fast. It was fast tracked in a way that everybody said, oh, the D.C. Circuit, like, yeah, it was early January. And we're still waiting. And nobody knows why we're still waiting, because, as you said, it did not go well for Trump's lawyer at argument. And we thought we'd get a, a written opinion by now. So one of the things that's happening is that this trial, as you said, in Judge Tanya Chutkin's courthouse, which was supposed to start in March, already is being extended to April. She's now saying she's having a trial in April. April. That a different one. She She's essentially saying, like, I've got a docket and I can't, you know, I'm waiting. And uh, this this Trump trial now probably starts in April. So then under that question and under the question of we've already stipulated the Fonnie Willis trial is not going to happen before the election. The Mar-a-Lago trial is going to happen when you and I have great, 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 great grandchildren. That's because Judge Cannon. That's Judge Eileen Cannon in uh, Florida, who is just basically working for the Trump team. And then the only other case is this sort of Stormy Daniels right. hush money case, right? The Alvin Bragg Which uh, prosecution. Which business records kind of case. Right. Yeah. It, it, it's the it's the sort of payoff case. And I think everybody would agree that's the weakest case. And that may end up being the first. And it may end up, depending on how fast the D.C. court can go on the Jack Smith case, that may end up being the only case before the election. Wow. Law is a slow, slow. Well, that's the point you kind of make, which right. is law isn't the way to do this or. It is a way to do this, but it's too slow. It's not the only way. So so here's a fun fact for listeners. Everybody always says that you and I used to have arky, sparky, funny conversations. And now we're just like our heads are on the table as we sob quietly. But here's a fun fact. Okay. The Supreme Court I'll courtyard. Be, I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> this, it is a fun fact. The Supreme Court has turtles built in all over the architecture of the building on one first street. Literally, there's turtles like in the courtyard. As Stone in turtles. A slow animal. That is a slow ass animal. And the idea that we have, which is make law go faster, which is kind of the zeitgeist we're in right now, is understandable because law is slow. And as you say in the piece, I said, you know, Donald Trump is going to appeal, 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 right? That's his MO. He's been doing that for decades. His dad did that before him, right? That's the Roy Cohn move. So law is slow. He has an MO, which is just to 
slow things down and litigate and litigate and litigate and delay and delay and delay. My question is, when does this three-judge panel finally crap out a decision? Everybody is shocked that it's taken this long, as you and I both And said. why do you suspect it is? Because they, the three don't agree on the reasoning, and therefore they have to iron out any differences before they issue a decision? Is that... It could be. I mean, the the, the Politico piece uh, sort of speculates that the conservative judge is maybe, you know, kind of slow walking this for some reason, or maybe there is some dispute about, you know, wh who's writing it or how it's being written. I mean, they have to produce an Jesus opinion. Jesus Christ. Right? So it's the turtle problem. And what's surprising is, A, they heard it in a hurry, and B, if you listen to that oral argument, it seemed pretty unequivocal. Trump was going down. So 50 days later, I wake up every morning waiting for it to come down. Is that how long it's been? I think it's been 50 days. Wait a minute. It was in January, though. I'm checking my phone. It says more than 50 days have elapsed since Trump. Oh, I was wrong. You were uh -huh. wrong. Since the proceedings were put on hold. It's been, it's been 50 days since Judge Chutkin had to pause it. And you are exactly right that it was heard uh, da, 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 on January 8th. Yeah. So it's really just a month, three weeks, three weeks. Yeah. yeah. But it's it's a long time. Yeah. Okay. because Everything I remember I after that, you just went, OK, we know where they're coming down. And yeah. when let's 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 get to it. Come yeah. on. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Let's get to it. Let's get it. Uh, to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court will probably take it, right? Supreme Court almost has to take it. So let, let's let's review again. It's immunity. Mean, the president can do anything un, uh, unless he is impeached and convicted. Yes. And not, there's no recourse right. against the president doing anything, right. including assassinating a rival that, with a that, SEAL team. That that appears to be the posture uh, they took at argument and 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 goaded many times with hypotheticals to take a more minimalist posture, they declined. So we would think this opinion would write itself, uh, but it's also a major constitutional question that would presumably go to the Supreme So Court. are you of a, of a view that we may not get one single trial done except for the Stormy Daniels case? Uh, before the election. So here's where it gets complicated. I think if Judge Chutkin starts this case, the Jack Smith January 6th case, and it could presumably be short, doesn't it's not going to be months. Right. Uh, there is a scenario in which it gets done before the election. There's also real pressure on the judges who are hearing all these cases to pause the lawsuits because it's peak election season, right? Because you can't keep a guy from campaigning, right? Trump has been already, right, was trying to stop the E. Jean Carroll case that happened last week in New York and was telling the judge, I've got to go to New Hampshire and campaign, right? So at some point, the optics of having a defendant who cannot, be, the judge, the court will, and right, in E. Jean, he didn't have to show up. He could have right. not been there. In these criminal cases, he has to be there. And so for a judge to so say- he's required to be there every day? Clear your calendar <laughs> and you don't get to campaign, right? Looks terrible. And so we are in a like huge ticking clock situation. Does he get to campaign like after the- day's work is over in the trial? Does he get to go out and do a rally? That's his MO, right? I mean, he was campaigning on the steps of Judge uh, Kaplan's court in, in New York last week. You know, every he walks outside of the court and he essentially does a campaign. Well, it worked stuff. well for him. It, well, it turns out juries really hate him. And that is good news. It turns out that for the first time. Review some of the things he said during that trial. That I mean, if you're a uh, if you're in this case, first of all, it had already been judged that he had defamed her. Okay. And this was about what, what was the case about just to see if he should be fined some more because he defamed her again. Right. After it was, <laughs> after he's, after it was adjudicated that he had defamed her and had to pay $5 million. Right. 
he defamed her. Right. And then so they went back because you defamed me again. And I want to hear about that. That's, wait, there's so, one, one fix on that, which is there were two E. Jean Carroll suits. One was for defamation that happened after he was not in office. One was for defamation that happened when he was president in 2019. Okay. The first one, as you said, was heard first. That was actually after he was out of office. The second one was tricky because he made a claim that this was like presidential speech that was protected because he was version of the immunity argument, right? I was president, so it's all okay. So this second case was for de defamation that he did while he was president. Right. And you're exactly right. The first jury said A, committed sexual abuse, B, defamation, $5 million. The second time round, last two weeks in uh, Manhattan, the only issue for the jury was stipulated. You committed defamation. You committed st sexual abuse. What's the dollar amount to make it stop? That's what the jury had and to And he showed up. He was like, imagine a cartoon toddler, like lying on their back in their diaper, like kicking their feet in their hands and just screaming. Like he was a tantrum bomb. He was glaring at E. Jean Carroll. He was muttering at the jurors. And she said something like he was nothing to her. And suddenly she was not afraid of him. Yeah. She gave an amazing interview um, to Rachel Maddow on Monday night with her attorney, Robbie Kaplan, where she said, like, I just realized he was just like a big walrus. Like he was, I was terrified of him. I was sitting across the courtroom. He was sitting right behind her and like scowling at her. And she realized like he's nothing. He's this ephemeral thing who's surrounded by money and powerful people. But we took him out. But he was interrupting the judge so early and often that the judge at one point threatened to like remove him from the court. And Trump was like, do it, do it. I dare you. And then it was compounded because his parking lot lawyer, like his literal real estate lawyer, Alina Haba, who didn't know how to put something into evidence, kept defying the judges. Why, do, why does he hire people like that? Is it because uh, people of a higher caliber refuse to represent him now? Yeah. I mean, he had a decent lawyer, this guy, Joe Tecapina, who represented him on the first Eugene Carroll suit. I don't think he was such a great choice. He was a bully. And he yeah. certainly belittled Eugene, but at least he was a sort of adept lawyer. He knew that when the judge said, sit down, you sit down. We think, we don't know for sure, he intimated- But he, he looked like uh, a bit of a goon. Yeah. He looked like a thug. He, he looked like a thug. So if your client- <laughs> he was being accused of sexually assaulting and rape, actually. He was accused of rape and defaming her. Have a guy who looks like a thug questioning her in a very hostile way, I don't think was. It was a disaster. And, yeah. the, jury, and the jury saw right through it. He didn't quit the second E. Jean Carroll case until right before trial, at which point Alina Haba sailed in. And the theory for why he quit, he said in some interview that they're like he and Donald Trump had had some like material parting of the ways. But the theory is because he kept Donald Trump off the stand in the first trial. He was the reason he was like, you do not want this jury to, to meet you, Donald Trump. And Trump was pissed because he was like, I'll simply charm them with my big heart and gracious attitude. And so it turns out that whether he's there or whether he's not there, whether he has it seems if or he's there, it's 80 3.3 was, was that <laughs> yes. what it was yes. as opposed to five right right so that i think that's the difference between him being there or not is 78.3 right million plus, dollars plus way this, to go donald this is important he kept defaming her during the trial right like the day he lost e Jean carroll the first one last may not the day, maybe two days after, he goes on TV and defames her again, right? And so Robbie Kaplan, her lawyer, standing in front of the jury is like, he has been getting on Truth Social every night of this trial and continuing to defame her. Like, he's like a he's like a, a defamation machine. And so her <laughs> claim to the jury was like, figure out what it would take to stop him, not to like punish him for what he did in 2019. 
to make it stop. And here's the good news. That decision came down Friday at like five o'clock and he has not defamed her yet. So it turns out maybe $88 million from the first trial and the second is in fact enough to make him shut up. They finally hit the number. I maybe like five I mean, million wasn't the number. Five million wasn't going to do it, but you know I think there is some lesson here, and this goes to your bigger question, which is why can't the law hold this guy to account? Like it did. It seems to have stopped the behavior, right? And for somebody who I had when written, does she get any of this money? Ah, uh, that's a hard question. Like I think that's really the question. He says he's going to appeal it. Does he have a recourse to a? Appeal? Does a court have to take an appeal? I think, yes, he can appeal. It's it's a pretty high standard because a jury verdict, you know, you can't appeal what the jury decided. You have to find a mistake uh, that Judge Kaplan made. And, and he will appeal it because, as we said, that's his M.O. He's been running out the clock for years. And but is it possible that no one will take that appeal? Uh, it that is certainly whoever, possible that he will not win. But I think the idea not is win the an appeal eventually someday. By win an appeal, mean get an appeal or? No, he will file an appeal. That's his prerogative. Or yes. That's what he says. But does someone have to accept it? Yes. Somebody will hear it. And Somebody will hear it. And if there's no merit, it goes away. E. Jean Carroll is 80. Now, that new trial, would that have a jury? That wouldn't have, the, the, an appeal wouldn't need a jury. Uh, that okay. would be an appellate court, you know, just saying, was there a mistake made? Right. Lower and so that judge can't go like, oh, and another. Yeah. Eighty three million dollars. Well, one thing that can happen is that a judge can knock down the damages amount. A, a judge can say, like, this is just way oh, I see. too big. Mm -hmm. So that can certainly happen. And, and and let's just remember, like Donald Trump sneezes and people give him money. Right. Like this is not going to come from his couch. cushion. Could he knock it down from eighty three point three to eighty three point two nine? I'm going to knock it down, but um, yeah, it, only ten cents. I, I, I mean, I, it, it, it could take a long time. I, I, I think the point you just raised about what Eugene said, and 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 pause to say, like, what does it say about us that the person who prevails is an eighty-year-old right woman, despite the fact that there have been more than two dozen of people who've claimed that he has assaulted them, but. What Eugene, I think, is saying is that we have a story we keep telling, including where you and I started, which is the law can't stop him. We don't know how to stop him because he doesn't believe in the law, right? Because <laughs> the judge says, I'm going to throw you out of court. And Trump is like, bring it on, right? Because he doesn't believe that he answers to anyone. But it seems like in this case, the law stopped him. Whether it will pay him. whether Will, it will you be pay satisfied? Him. That they stopped him before he pays off. I th that's oh my god! You and the existential questions. The fun never ends. I will be satisfied <laughs> because no. I needed to know that a jury was going to look at that guy and say you suck. That's that's that feels a little good. And no? this had to cause him some pain, and. Not teach him a lesson, of course. He, that's in, he's incapable of that. But he I had to go like, whoa, eighty three point three million. That's that's actually real money to him. And that this jury took under three hours, right, to sift through all the evidence and to be like, oh, we realize this is a lot of money, but that's how much we hate you. That's <laughs> good. I like that. I mean, I think we just that's take our wins. That's a that's a little win, and I think it's a template. You know, to your bigger question about why can't the law stop him? The law is slow, right? These, these, this is a case from 2019. It would be funny if they, uh, they actually, it was actually 73 million, <laughs> and they said, but we also want to write, and we hate you. And the judge said, you can't write that. And they go, oh, okay, then 83. <laughs> Here's another. That was thing. worth 10 billion. Here's another thing <laughs> that we can't do that. Here's another thing. Having just been a little hopey by accident, it is very interesting to me that Judge Kaplan then admonished the jury. I've never seen anything like this. Nobody should ever know that you were on this jury. Like he essentially said, keep this to yourself. You're not safe. And that mm. is like mob trial. Like that is crazy pants that he said, 
I'm not going to tell you one, one way or another, but I'm not sure I'd go around and broadcast that I was on this jury. And that's the part of it that like, you know, that's the pit in well, your stomach. Well, what if I already told someone? <laughs> I, I, I think my Mortimer. wife knows. My wife probably knows. Yeah, no, I, I mean, and I just she think. She tells everybody everything. It was a male jury, wasn't it? It was, I think Largely it was six male. men, three women. I oh, think. okay. But I've been wrong about everything else to <laughs> Probably wrong about that. I think it was six men and three women. So basically, what you're saying here is that there isn't going to be one of these four cases, not not Georgia, certainly not Mar-a-Lago documents. The only one really is January 6th. And and Stormy Daniels, maybe. Stormy Daniels could happen, but that doesn't seem to be the... May not, may not be the, the three-pointer we're looking for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But the January 6th one, it, it's just amazing how long it's taken on, on this immunity thing. And then the Supreme Court would take it, right? Then presumably the court could take it. And we've just talked about the Colorado case, right? Mm -hmm. The immunity one could go up to the court. I'm willing to bet there's going to be a bunch of other stuff. I think gag orders, you know, that are being litigated, right? He's challenging gag orders. Folks need to remember that there were 60 some cases filed that he filed, right? With his like Sidney Powell, Kraken, Giuliani, like crazy. Oh, you mean uh, in 2020. Of, of which they lost every one except one. Yeah. A minor, yes. On a and minor. that was to cure ballots. Right. The curing ballots just for the audience is that if someone's vote didn't count for some reason, like their signature on the ballot didn't match the signature when they registered, maybe they, that person had a stroke in between. And if the lawyers for, say, um, Biden found that person and brought him to the election office and they could say, yeah, I had the stroke and this, that's me. And they go, okay, that counts. And the case they won was the uh, Biden people wanted to extend that period to nine days instead of six. And they lost that one of all the cases over 60 cases. That was the case they lost. And these were Trump judges in some of these cases. I mean, some of oh, these yeah. cases were. But in that one, it probably made no difference yeah, no whatsoever. Difference. None. They lost every single case in which they alleged that the election had been stolen. And some of those judges were Trump judges. And the Supreme Court batted those cases away, right? The Supreme Court had an opportunity to step in, didn't step in. With the, with the amicus uh, brief written by Mike Johnson for the. Uh, the house, right? Right, right. No, I mean there was there was serious the Republican attorneys general like there was serious yeah. momentum to back Trump on the election was stolen, and they found no purchase in the courts. So my only point in the Supreme Court, yeah, well, but they lost in the lower courts. And oh, okay, they couldn't get they couldn't get it to stick. So so it's important to say we don't know what's coming. Right. This is like, did we know in the February before Bush v. Gore that that was going to the court, you know, that there was going to be hanging chads in a Florida recount that decided that election? Oh, yeah, boy. We didn't. And so we, I keep saying, look at the whole board and we don't even know what the pieces on the board are going to be. You know what's sad? <laughs> Tell we, me. <laughs> we know who won the election. You know, and he still says it. on on the night that he won New Hampshire, he gave this victory speech, which was nine tenths going after her. But he said, we won New Hampshire in 16 and we won it even bigger in 20. Acting like he won it in 16. He didn't win it in 16. We actually won it in 16. We actually won it bigger than we did in 16, which he didn't win. And it's just, he's a guy who knows how to put a wrinkle on a lie to make another lie seem accurate or seem not a lie. I think he is a guy who has figured out that every mechanism we have for determining what is true, whether it's the press, whether it's science, whether it's a court of law, 
can be subverted, right, by simply saying, I will tell you what's true. And that would only happen if there were not where that would not happen, where there are not millions and millions and millions of people who believe when he says, I won in 2020. Well, remember, it was the first friggin' day that he sends Spicer out there to say Trump's inaugural crowd was bigger than either of Obama's. And then Kellyanne Conway came out the next day and said, there are alternative facts. Right. And I laughed when I heard that. and. I don't laugh anymore at that because there are fake facts. And because there are fake facts, there are alternative facts to correct the fake facts. And what happened was they basically, it's the Bannon flooding the zone with shit. Yep. And if you flood the zone with shit, there's no truth anymore. And you get to pick it yourself. And that's why 70 odd percent or more now of, Trump people believe that he won the election. Right. And and this is the Hannah Arendt authoritarian playbook. The outcome isn't just that Trump gets to decide what's true. It's that people come to doubt science and journalism and institutions and law. Right. Hannah Arendt was the one who wrote about the Holocaust and how it happened. Right. She was she sort of she sort of becomes the was sort she a of, social psychologist or what was she she covered the she covered the trial i don't know what her training was in she covered nuremberg was it eichmann or i think she covered the eichmann trial we we are gonna have to google hannah arendt and what she did but like her whole thing is the point is less that you believe the fascist it's that you give up trust in every fact-finding institution, right? If if you can take, that's the flood the zone with bullshit, that's the Bannon thing, mm-hmm. is that everyone is lying to you. You can't trust anyone. And so you trust the strong man. So we sometimes forget that there's one more step in that chain. It's not just that we believe anything Trump says. It's that every entity that exists to ferret out the truth is lying to us. And that's why it's very, very scary when you put all of your hope in a trial Because there are millions and millions of people who just say whatever that was that happened last week in Judge Kaplan's court was a witch hunt. And so that's the end game. And that's how authoritarians like rise. Who who wrote The Handmaid's Tale? Margaret Atwood. She said, I didn't hear it, but a friend of mine, Brad Whitford, who is in Handmaid's Tale, said, said he listened to a podcast that she was on. And she said, people have to remember that the Nazis had fun. Oh, good grief. Well, now, and ladies and gentlemen, rock bottom. Boom. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, that's the Bannons of this world, you know? Right, right. And that's Roger Stone. I mean, this is fun, Alex Jones. These guys love it. This is, this is you know, sort of performance art. But I, I want to say two hopey things. Okay. One hopey thing, I think that's why it matters to me that a jury of nine people, right, regular people, looked at Donald Trump and were like, "Eh, no, you suck. That matters because it suggests that people are persuadable. The other thing, and this is this is like where you and I started, and it's really important, I think, to land the plane. The piece didn't say the piece that I wrote last week didn't say because the law may be too slow to get him off the ballot in the election or to or to, you know, have a criminal conviction before the election. Everything sucks. What the piece said was, therefore, if the machinery of law isn't going to get us there or all the way there or get us there in time, the machinery of democracy still can. Right. And the piece really wasn't saying we're just fucked. The piece was trying to say, if you are sitting back and watching these trials as sort of theater, right, the theater of it makes me so happy because I'm seeing like this Shakespearean trial play out. It's not enough. Like freaking go sign up voters, register voters, <laughs> offer to be a person who works at, you know, your polling place because polling place workers are old and scared and being terrorized, right? Like do stuff. And every single minute that we spend with this kind of learned helplessness of the law alone can get us there is a minute we're not doing what you and I know is the work of democracy. Said someone who's 
studies the law and writes about the law and is all about the law. I mean, I think the law and democracy are like hand in hand on this. And I think that it's 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 very gratifying to sit around and be like, Merrick Garland, you're too slow. I'm so mad at you. Also, I'm really still mad at Ruth Bader Ginsburg for not retiring. Like I get the grievance, but that doesn't win elections. So like we have to like dig ourselves out of this moment in which we're like, I really am confident the court's going to do the right thing on the Colorado ballot. I'm going to wait until June when that decision comes down. Like June is too late to be thinking about this election. And also now is too late to be thinking about like we need to we need to do the work. Thank you, Dahlia. As always. Always a pleasure. Well, I I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week. Mm -hmm.